Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone. We're glad to have you here this morning. And we are in the book of James in our study on wisdom. And James continues to speak to our hearts. And again, we need to understand that the word of God is like a mirror, as if you were to look into it and you are able to see a reflection of yourself. That's exactly what James wants you to do in regard to the scriptures. And as you gather each and every Sunday morning and you come and sit under the preached word of God, we desire for it to speak to our hearts, to show us how we're to live and how we're to carry out our lives that would bring glory to him. So as we begin and look at our passage for this morning, again, James is going to be doing that tough surgery on our heart, the the types of passages of scripture that we may not always like because it points out to us some of the faults, some of the failures that we have, and it reminds us of the things that God is going to continue to change in our life, and he's going to again talk to us about our speech this morning. And we um, want you to understand, this is not the day where you elbow your husband or your wife and say, this sermon was made for you today. Uh, It's not one of those where you say to me at the door, uh, well, I need to make sure my son or daughter hears this sermon, or I have a friend that this was for. I want you to understand that the Lord is speaking to you, and you can't escape his presence. And he is speaking to you directly. So today, I want you to elbow yourself, And I want you to point like this because three fingers are pointing back at you and you are needing to sit under the word of God this morning, even though it might be a little uncomfortable. And now, unfortunately, the scriptures are going to, well, not unfortunately, this is what God does. He molds and shapes us into life. I was trying to be politically correct there. Did you realize that? And I'm sorry for that. That's not uh, what we should be doing. But I want you to understand that Jesus is going to perform surgery on our heart this morning. He again is going to open us up and he's going to reveal the good, the bad, and even the ugly. Because we're going to hear how we've been able to use a a vessel within our body with such cunning and such a way we even throw daggers and even arrows at other people. And so imagine that you're sitting here alone and you are the only one in the room and the Lord is speaking to you today. Because the power that is found in our mouth with the tongue that the Lord has given to us, with our speech, we are able to either hurt or to heal. And so often our, our community and our interaction with people is often with words of hurt. Think about the damage that has been done by the words we've said. Think about the opportunity if we could do this, if we could pull back some of the words that we've said to one another, if we could do that, which we can't. And then those words have gone out and they have affected those that have heard them or been the target of them. We can either hurt or we can heal. The power of the tongue is enough to be able to destroy, to even set wars in our world, to even bring wars to an end with the power of the tongue or the speech in our bodies. And so that's how powerful this little vessel is among us. When I was young enough to go out for recess during my school days, I remember what it was like on the school playground, seeing the bullies that were there that would often use words to say something to me or to my friends. And we had that little saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And I can still remember kids saying that on the playground. I still hear it in my community when I'm walking around my dog. I might hear some kids fighting, and that will be the response. It's the most horrible response we could ever teach to our children because it's such a lie. It does not represent truth at all because those words do slay us. And unfortunately, some of us are sitting here this morning and the words that we heard in our childhood require therapy for us today. That's how powerful it is. I have met many people. I remember one in a church that I was in and I wasn't a pastor at that time, but I remember a person coming to me and he said, my family has never told me that they love me. My mom and dad have never even hugged me. My mom and dad have never said that they're proud of me. And this person was wondering how could God be in the midst 
and why am I trying to tell them about the beauty of God in that kind of setting and the damage that was done to him because that's the way he was brought up and the words that were said to him over a lifetime. And he was wondering now in his early 20s about what the Lord is going to do in his life and how could he retrieve what has been lost by the words that came out of people's mouths. Sticks and stones will break my bones. It's really, words will certainly break us. And so James is going to speak to your heart and he's going to speak about your tongue this morning and he's going to tell you how to control it. He's been saying that about speech in the book already. In chapter 1, he's given us some verses. He said this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And if that wasn't enough for you, he said, If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So James is going to point out to you the very fact that the gospel continues to transform even the way you speak with your mouth. And your speech will be confined by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit is going to change the way you speak and talk to other people. He can take the one who has the foul mouth and be able to turn it into a mouth that is giving praise and glory to God. He's able to take the words that you will say and change them so that they are words that truly bring healing because the power of the Holy Spirit is working in your life. Someone said this, it can sway men to violence. It can instruct the ignorant, encourage the dejected, the dying, or it can crush the human spirit and destroy reputations and lust and hate and bring nations to the brink of war. Think about that. That is within you. is right there every single day. And every word that comes from your mouth will eat or heal those around you. So let's listen to the word of God. He's, James is going to give us some speech therapy. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to chapter 3. We're halfway through the book. We have many more weeks to go. But I, what James is going to tell you today is going to be make your marriage better. It's going to make your relationship with your kids stronger. If you follow the instruction and hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you, it will also change the way you face conflict in your workplace because it's going to teach you how to care for one another and how to build one another up. It's going to teach you how to give words of healing instead of words of hurt. So let's listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning from James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large, they are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts in great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire even by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile of the sea or sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father in church services, and with it we curse brothers or people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Wow, this is very important instruction for God's people this morning. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit 
to have it seep into our hearts. Oh, Lord, we are grateful for you are all powerful. You're able to move in our heart this morning and continue the work of transformation into the image of Jesus Christ that you desire for all of your children. And so we pray that in the hearing of your word this morning, that that would be our prayer, that we would be receptive, we wouldn't be nudging our husbands and wives in the pew and saying, this one's for you. May you teach us that it's for us, individually, with the power to bring great healing into our culture, to our city, to our world, and you're able to use speech for that very purpose. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to guard our tongue, for it is a representation of where our heart truly is. And when hurt comes from our mouth, it's a reflection of where our heart truly is. So, Father, would you convict us this morning? Would you show us how we have to put aside and put off the old nature and put on the new? To be conformed more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. May we value one another with great dignity and honor because each of us have been made in the image of God. May we remember that when we spew words that may be painful and hurtful to others. Well, Father, we pray that you bring comfort and healing to those that have experienced great hurt because of what they've heard. May you comfort and lift up the downcast. All for your glory's sake, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In my home, we have taught our children that it was not proper to say to one another, you're stupid or you're an idiot. So when they would say those words in their early childhood, we made sure that there were timeouts made so that they would understand that those words are never acceptable in our home. I was raised the same way. And so we made sure that we were trying to make sure that the words from their mouth were always encouraging and sibling rivalry would be sort of dissipated and and destroyed when we could see it. Uh, But that's the way we did it in our home. And that's really what James wants us to understand about how we are able to use speech in such a way that it would bring hope and healing instead of destruction. So I've watched people slay one another with their words. I've been in restaurants where husbands and wives are going at it with one another, not with any regard for anyone else in the restaurant, and I hear the words that have been said, and it pains me to hear the damage that they were doing in public. It got to that point. Think about how many marriages have been ruined by the very words we've said to one another. Yet there was a day when we sat or stood side by side and made a vow to each other that I will love you in sickness and in health in the good days and the bad days and we had that joy of knowing that we wanted to be together forever and yet in years to come we hear how they slayed each other with words. What happened in that setting? What happened that led them to a marriage that was destroyed because of the very words and the verbal abuse that went on to one another. And we see that everywhere. We see it in the playgrounds at school. We hear now that we have shaming going on through social media. So last year, a teenage girl who was 17 encouraged her boyfriend to commit suicide and taunted him with texts over and over again for the course of two or three months, and her boyfriend eventually took his life, and she was put on trial and convicted because of the words of shaming her boyfriend into taking a life. Can you imagine that kind of relationship of a boyfriend and a girlfriend? What got them to the point of being able to think that that's something acceptable in our culture and in the world that we live? Why is it acceptable that bullies can continue to bully people, not only in school, but even in college, and even in the workplace, and no one says anything? Why are we like that? Why will we not speak words of hope when we see See the damage that's destroying human life. And the church has been placed here and God is saying that the words that come from your mouth that are shaped by the gospel are the words of hope, words of life for the world to hear. And so often we can sit just as silent as Adam was when Eve took the apple from the tree. And the silence of God's people 
has been the problem so often in our culture. And so as we think about the role that God wants to teach us this morning, we need to understand that he wants to shape the very words that come out of our mouth and the power that we see there can be changed for good. And the gospel is powerful enough to take a mouth that is filthy and turn it into something that's holy. Do you believe that this morning? So he begins by an illustration by saying, look, not many of you should strive to be teachers. He's not saying don't try to be people that should teach. He's not trying to make you avoid it. He's trying to tell you this is what happens when you are a pastor, that you need to understand that the power of your words can shape and influence people. And he's trying to say be careful and understand the power of words and the power of speech. So he begins with that little illustration, a reminder to me about what I should be saying and doing as I lead as your pastor, that you know that you'll be judged with greater strictness, and so I have to be cognizant, I have to be aware of what the Lord has given to me, that I have the power to elevate life and I could have the power to destroy it. That's how important it is. Think about school teachers in our system who see the children that are brought in that might be finding children coming into their classrooms that have never been told by their parents that they're loved. And we see the damage that it's done. Our school teachers, as my daughter begins teaching, even in her student teaching, she would tell us the stories of what were happening in the lives of some of these students that she had and how painful it was for her to sit there and see and to hear what actually goes on in homes, and it's usually by the power of the tongue and the verbal abuse that people have received. So James tells us, he said, the tongue is set among our members and staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. He wants you to understand that when you use words that hurt, then you're really doing the bidding of what the evil one wants us to do in this world. So James is going to remind us that we're going to stumble in many ways. If you get something out of this this morning, may you understand your frailness and your brokenness. May you understand your desperate need of the gospel because we are not people that have it all together. We are not people that are perfect. And there has never been a perfect human being. There has never been a perfect marriage. There's never been a perfect relationship because we stumble and fall, but the gospel continues to flow into our life and continues to make these things better and brings greatness and beauty out of the brokenness that we see all around us. And so James wants to start off reminding you of these very things. No one is perfect, but he does want you to understand that we can become more mature in our following of Jesus Christ. And when our words are used to hurt one another, it's showing that you're not spiritually mature yet. There's much more work to be done in your life, and the gospel needs to seep down even further into your life. But he wants you to understand that your speech is a barometer of your spirituality. So how do you talk to your spouse? How do you talk to your husband or your wife? How do you speak to your children? Are you encouraging them each day, or are you making them wonder if they're truly loved? That can happen in the church. I hope you realize that. How many kids have been raised hearing, I don't think you will amount to anything? I've heard it even in the last week. I heard it over my ministry years. I've had a pastor tell me that in my beginning part of ministry. He said, I don't think you'll ever amount to anything as a preacher. The words were not encouraging. They weren't words that were helpful. They were words that I can still remember now, 25 years later, as if it was yesterday. And what's the effect on it for me? I'm out to sometimes prove him every day that he was wrong. And that's the effect of what our words can do. Words from 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we can be living today as if it happened yesterday and we're trying to fulfill or try to show that they are not 
fulfilling. That's how powerful our words are. And James wants you to understand, it is not to be so in God's people. It's not to be so in God's church. And you think about the anger that we can see expressed in our way of life, and it happens in the church, I need to let you know. It happens when you might not be happy with something that we may do, and sometimes the anger then gets expressed to some of our staff in the past and in the future. Those things will happen. Why do we do it that way? Do you realize how powerful your words are and how much hurt that it can bring? So James is gonna give you three illustrations to help you understand the power of what's going on. He said, look, I want you to think about bits on a horse's mouth. Now, if you need to understand this, we have a horse whisperer in this congregation. Jerry Johnson is that horse whisperer. So if you want to understand this illustration a little bit better, I would encourage you to talk to him afterwards and tell or talk to him, what does a bit do in a horse's mouth? Because I've been at his farm and saw him put the bits into an enormous horse that was taller than me. And that was when Jerry was able to move that horse wherever he wanted it to go when he put that bridle and bit into their mouth. And James is going to say, look, this little piece of metal that we stick into the horse's mouth is able to move this monstrous being in any direction that you want it to go. That's the first illustration he wants you to understand. That's like the power of the tongue. It's very little, but it can do so much, either for good or so much for bad. Then he gives you another illustration. He's gonna say, look, Think about a rudder on a ship. Now, when I was growing up in Canada in the summer, I used to, we had a sailboat, a laser. And so if any of you know what a laser is, but I enjoyed doing that of going out and enjoying the wind. And I had a little rudder on the end of the, at the back of the boat that I would steer and be able to take me miles across the lake and enjoy uh, sailing in this little boat. But it was that little rudder that was able to take these great winds. And whenever the great winds came, that's when we got the sailboat out because we wanted to enjoy it. You went faster and I could go 30 miles an hour in this little laser and hang out where I might have to keep my feet and sometimes topple out on the other side, but I enjoyed that part, and James is saying, look, this little rudder that was able to take this 30-foot sailboat and change the direction or its course, wherever it would go, he said, the tongue is just like that. He wants you to understand it's such a small thing, but yet it can do something amazing and enormous in this world for good if we allow the gospel to work through our speech. And then he gives another illustration about how a little spark starts a fire. Now, we in our summer home, we're about two hours north of the city of Toronto, and a few years ago when we were visiting, a forest fire started so that we could sit on our deck and watch the advancement of the forest fire. It got so large that the Canadian government had to send in four tanker planes that would scoop down over the water and pick up the water off the lake and then go and dump it. We could watch the whole thing from our front deck, and we began to see how it got bigger and bigger, but it was started by one little cigarette butt that was thrown out the window and torched this area. And we began to worry, will this get bigger and bigger? And as we sat and heard the the power of those airplanes picking up the water and then watching them dump it over there, we saw the effect of how this little spark was able to destroy so much of the forest. And that was a small forest fire but think about those that have ravaged California and the different places around the country that we've heard and seen. And James wants you to compare that to the power of your tongue. He gives you three three illustrations so that you would get it. Do you realize how powerful your tongue is? Yet it's so small, but it can destroy your marriage. Yet it's so small, it can destroy the relationship between you and your children. It's so small that it can cause wars, though. You need to understand how powerful the tongue is when it's left unchecked by the power of the gospel and the influence of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that enables you to speak in a way that will build up one another. Do you hear the passages over and over in the scripture? Encourage one another, build up one another, because we need that. And yet we can sit in a restaurant and hear a husband and wife going at it and being at war with one another. We can sit in our backyards and hear the yelling in our neighbors' households. 
and we can see the effect of children coming into school, coming into fi hopefully finding a safe place or a teacher that would care and build them up and encourage them and even hug them and give them words of hope and life. James wants you to understand that that's what the Lord wants your tongue to be doing. He wants that kind of speech to be flowing out of you instead of the constant abuse or the daily routine of verbal abuse with one another and instead of crushing each other's souls that we would give words of hope and encouragement to one another. He desires that in us. And he gives you a further illustration. Have you ever been to the zoo lately? Have you been able to see what we're able to do with lions and tigers and bears? Have you been to SeaWorld and been able to see what we're able to do with dolphins and whales? We're able to have them do tricks and, and do things because we've been able to tame them. And so James said, look, every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I heard a story this week of a man who was killing a rattlesnake in his front yard. And so he took a shovel and he severed the head from the body of the snake. And yet he went and picked up the snake's head and it still bit him. And he was life flighted out and had to have many doses of anti-venom. And even in that small little head that he thought was severed and now dead, still had enough power to take the human body down, and he almost died from it. And James is trying to help you understand that we cannot tame the tongue on our own ability. It is the power of the gospel. It's Jesus coming into your life and changing the way your marriage is lived out, changing the way you raise your children because now this new life that is yours, Jesus pervades. And now Jesus is displayed in the way you talk to each other and the way you encourage one another and the way you build one another up. He doesn't want to see marriages torn apart by our words. He wants to see our marriages built up by the words that come out of our mouth. He doesn't want to see division between parents and children to where they're no longer talking to one another or maybe your long-lost sibling or your long-lost neighbor or your long-lost relative where you gather for family outings but some people don't show up because the words that have been spoken in the past have caused such division that we no longer want to be in the presence of one another anymore. And how common is that? If we were all to raise our hands and say that we have somebody that we have displaced in our family tree, I think almost every one of us would be able to raise our hands. And Jesus is saying, that should not be so. That should not be the way of the kingdom. And so he said, from the mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. So Warren Wiersbe tells this story about a pastor it has comedy in it, but there's something to learn from it as well. A pastor told a story about a member in his church with, who was a notorious gossip. They would get on the phone and tell anything that they heard or knew or even made up what they could about the person in their church, and they would pass it along by phone. And so this person had this regular routine of coming to the pastor and confessing that they have a problem with their tongue. And the pastor knew that this was not what they really wanted to do. They were happy in being able to gossip about others. And so the pastor had this person come in and they said, I'd like to offer my tongue on the altar because I've realized I've done some great damage through my tongue. And the pastor, knowing that this person wasn't doing this for any point of repentance, calmly said to the, the person, there isn't an altar big enough. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. There isn't an altar big enough for the damage that your tongue can do. In a heartbeat, some of our words can make tears come out of people's eyes. In a heartbeat, we can make a child believe that life's not worth living. In a heartbeat, we're able to use these words to do such damage. And James is speaking to us, his church, to us as individuals, and reminding you, boy, 
realize you have the power to hurt or the power to heal and understand that Jesus Christ was the one who was able to come and speak perfectly. And his words were always healing words, never hurtful words. We have the perfect man who we can look to as a model, and it is the God-man, Jesus Christ. And even when he was reviled and when he was spit at and when he was accused of doing something that he had never done, what was his response? Even his words were gracious to those as he hung on the cross for the people he would die for that were his enemies. And that becomes the model, and Jesus said, walk in my footsteps follow after me, speak words of kindness. And so I close with this. Don't ever underestimate the power of your words. And then don't underestimate the power of the gospel. Yes, we can say the altar is too big for your tongue to be laying across it, but you need to understand that the gospel is far greater and far more powerful than you could ever imagine, and then the grace of God can change you And God is calling you to repent maybe this morning and turn from your hurtful words to healing words. So let us close with this. This is a hymn that was written. I wish to be like Jesus, so humble and so kind. His words were always tender. His voice was ever divine. But no, I'm not like Jesus, as everyone can see. Oh, Savior, come and help me and make me just like thee. May that be your prayer. May that be the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life this morning. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you've taught us again under surgery of our heart that our hearts can be very wicked and very destroying. We can be deceived so easily. So, Father, in the hearing of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit, would you convict us if we've been using words that have hurt our marriages and hurt our relationships with our children. And Father, may we not walk out of here and just sing, well, here's another sermon today. May we walk out of here desiring to be more like Christ. May you do that work in our relationships. Where there's broken down uh, relationships, Lord, may you give us the courage to try and, and rectify them and bring words of healing to those relationships. And in our marriages, Lord, we pray that you would restore us, that we would stop being at war with one another and instead use our words to encourage and build up one another. And Lord, if that's happening in our workplace, we pray that you do the same, that we would be able to speak words of hope to those that sometimes even hurt us. May you give us that courage to do so, but we know that the power is within us to do that, for you even loved your enemy. And so we know we can do the same. So we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. And may we, even as we look at our tongue and our speech and realize how we stumble and fall, may we be encouraged this day that you have the solution in your son, Jesus Christ. May we be more like him. For your glory's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.